Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's brand new episode. Today, we're going to be talking about racial discrimination and how do we change that. And this is going to be a new movement that, that I am initiating with my new co-host that I'm going to be introducing you to here just in just a little bit. But we're going to talk about racial discrimination, racist behaviors, and how do we change the racist behaviors. This requires an integrative, holistic approach. First, we have to admit that we have racist behaviors. And then we must begin an internal process of self-inquiry, self-learning. And for each person, this requires a willingness to look at where they can improve. My name is Cornelia Stephanie, and I'm the founder of Empower Network. I champion humanity's sovereignty. And for each person to be the authority over their life as empowered creators. My work is about inspiring self-healing, empowerment, authentic expression, liberation, equality. And so it's perfect to now begin this new movement with in 2020 with the whole uh, racism, the hatred that is still there that we really need to address at the core. I've seen on YouTube recently, there was, uh, there's a channel called Conversations with a Black Man. I, mm-hmm. I've caught an episode uh, recently of it and I thought that was really brilliant and now I've gathered my uh, tribe and we're going to be bringing it here on the radio first to you and also then on YouTube and we're going to be inviting you the public to take action with us and be active in this and not be passive not just listen to another podcast and feel good, but actually to do something with us, to make the change, to be the change that you want to see in the world, to be the peace that you want to see in the world and to be, to build the beloved community, because that's really what it is that we want to do is we want to build the loving community and the ladies that I'm going to introduce you to right here, right now, is part one, this is part one of the new movement, Be an Anti-Racist, part one. And right after this podcast, we're going to go right into Be an Anti-Racist, part two, at 1 p.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I invite you to stay with us throughout that whole time. And if not, when you see the link, you can always click on it again for the replay. And you can also, um, when we then go to YouTube, you can also look at it on YouTube. So let me introduce to you my new co-host for this new movement. This is a very special uh, person to me, as you're going to find out in the show. So my special guest is Latrice Love Goodlett, mother, singer, songwriter, award-winning public speaker, transformation coach, consultant, and certified mediator. She's a singer and has toured the US, Cuba, and Mexico. She's worked with Usher, Tupac, Mac Mall, Me- Mechlet, Hedero, Quinn DeVox, Candace Antique, Kila, Cava, Minas, Sean Hayes, and Ashanti Nu. She's married to guitarist, songwriter, producer, David Goodlett, founding member of the singing group, Good Love, Sounds of Matt and Too Divine. She currently runs her own social media and marketing boutique agency, Real McCoy, virtual assisting and consulting agency. And she's a trainer, facilitator, 
transformative coach and public speech speaker. She serves as Seeds Conflict Resolution Center, Community Programs Manager. She's responsible for all community public training offerings, including but not limited to mediation training and restorative justice training. Welcome to the show, Latrice. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. <laughs> wow. You know, I had no idea that you, you know, it is great to see your bio, mm -hmm. all, you know, the way I can introduce you today to the show. And, um, but I had no idea you traveled all over, you know, the U.S. and that yeah. you were um, singing with so many very famous people and that you're famous in your own right. I had no idea. You know, it's amazing what happens when we look at our accomplishments and our professional mm -hmm. things that we've achieved uh, because we know each other personally. Right. And, right? And, and actually, I was thinking about that this morning. Uh, you're not going to see it, but the audience is going to see it because I have a picture of you that <laughs> you wouldn't mind showing this picture. The picture. No, I don't that, mind. <laughs> you don't mind? Okay. No. Uh, Zach, would you show the picture to the audience, the one I sent you to show uh, where I think you're sitting in my lap and you were uh, a little girl, I think probably maybe four or five years old. Yeah. Um, but the thing about it is, I thought about it this morning, is that I've known you your whole life. Yeah. So yeah. When, when, what year were you born? 1979. Okay, so you were born in 1979. When I met you, you were probably about two years old, two mm -hmm. years old. And mm -hmm. we actually used to live together. Um, yeah. Because I thought about that this morning too. Is that, <laughs> oh, we actually we actually live together, and you know how how I've come to know you back in the day is that your one of your uncles was my first love, mm -hmm. and was in a, a long term relationship with your family. You know, yeah. or um, you know, a long part a of long my time. Life. Yeah. A long time, you know, and when I so basically I was 18, 17, 18, when I started going out with one of your uncles mm -hmm. and um, and I was active in your family because your family took me in as one of their own and mm -hmm. um, active in your family for, you know, a long time, like 15 years. And so you've been a part of my life for that time. And then just recently. You know, I want to say over this last past decade, we've mm -hmm. thank God to Facebook because that's how we were able to uh, connect <laughs> again. Yeah. Right. We got connected again on Facebook. And then um, you had contacted me and you said that you um, that you wanted to do some mentoring and that you mm -hmm. really wanted to step into your um, liberation all the way and that's mm -hmm. that's the way we got connected again and we started doing yeah. that work together and now here we are here we girl. are, <laughs> here we are. I, I can believe it because I believe in divine timing so I can believe it um, but it just it's an it's an immense gift you know? it is it is yeah. an immense gift you know it's, I, I'm so in awe of you I'm so proud of you I'm so you know because I I know you I know your heart I know mm -hmm. what you're doing I know what you're capable of and that's why today is such a very very special day to do this and to be here with you so um, one of the things that that happened this week Latrice is that I fell in love with a man that I didn't even know anything about and his name was um, Congressman John Lewis. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I I didn't I didn't even know I didn't know him. I didn't know anything about him. I I'm getting the chills now. So obviously you knew him. I know of him. You know yeah. of him. Okay. Yes. Well, you're getting ready to know a little bit more because I brought us a clip. Mm -hmm. Later on, when you watch the, the video again, you're going to be able to see the video and the audience can actually see it. Uh, but I brought a clip of the reason that you and I are here is because of him. Mm -hmm. And so I was in deep grief this, this past week because of what we have lost on this planet with laying him to rest. And I didn't know yeah. 
what an amazing uh, person he was and that he mm. was actually the voice, the consciousness of Congress Mm -hmm. And the things that he's had to endure in his life over being beaten so many, many times uh, to uh, unconscious and mm -hmm. in the hospital so many times, jailed like 40 times. Mm -hmm. So I was so moved by the level of integrity of who he is that he literally, you know, I see him as a saint and I see him as uh, the likes of Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. and also um, Gandhi. This is the level. So this is the grief that I had because, you know, all the slander that we've had in America now, you know, and the world also, but specifically yeah. in America of how, how everything is so crazy out here. So mm -hmm. much violence, so much hatred, so much slander, so much shame, so much of all of that, that um, meeting uh, Congressman John Lewis and the integrity of his life and what he's done, the one thing that I was so pleased about is being able to see him honored the way mm -hmm. that he was honored this week by the government. And I would live, I really am going to try to find out who is the one that made the choice to honor this man the beautiful way they did because mm -hmm. they gave him the full Monty, the full, right. he had everything. States honor. Yeah. And that's the States. It was everything for the entire week. And it was great. And that was really how I was able to get to know him. So Zach, would you mind playing that clip from, from him right now? You're going to hear him. He, he spoke these words at a commencement speech in 2014. And he was speaking to the college students. Mm -hmm. And but you're going to hear, you're going to hear what this man has to say. So this is why Latrice and I are here today. So uh, let's, let's listen. I grew up in rural Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, outside of a little place called Troy. My father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But back in 1944, when I was only four years old, my father had saved $300. And with the $300, he bought 110 acres of land. My family's still on that land today. How many of you remember when you were four? Now, what happened to the rest of us? It was many, many years ago when we would visit the little town of Troy, visit Montgomery, visit Tuskegee, visit Birmingham, I saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. I would come home and ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, why? And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But one day in 1955, 15 years old, in the 10th grade, I heard about Rosa Parks. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on our radio. 1957, I met Rosa Parks at the age of 17. In 1958, at the age of 18, I met Martin Luther King Jr. And these two individuals inspired me to get in the way, to get in trouble. So I come here to say to you this morning, on this beautiful campus, with your great education, you must find a way to get in the way. You must find a way to get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. Use your education. You have wonderful teachers, wonderful professors, researchers. Use what you have. Use your learning. Use your tools to help make our country and make our world a better place where no one will be left out or left behind. You can do it and you must do it. It is your time. In a few short days, we will commemorate what we call the Mississippi Summer Project. For more than a thousand students from all over America, many from abroad, 
made a trip to Mississippi to encourage people to register to vote. And if summer night of June 21st, 1964, three young men that I knew, two whites and one African-American, Nicholas Werner, Andy Goodman, and James Shaney, went out to investigate the burning of an African-American church that was used for voter registration workshop. These three young men were detained by the sheriff, taken to jail, taken out of jail, turned over to the Klan, where they were beaten, and shot, and killed. And I tell students today, these three young men didn't die in Vietnam. They didn't die in the Middle East or Eastern Europe. They didn't die in Africa or Central or South America. They died right here in our own country, trying to help all of our citizens become participants in the democratic process. As young people, you must understand that there are forces that want to take us back to another period. But you must say that we're not going back. We made too much progress and we're going forward. There may be some setbacks, some delays, some disappointment, but you must never, ever give up or give in. You must keep the faith and keep your eyes on the prize. That is your calling. That is your mission. That is your moral obligation. That is your mandate. Get out there and do it. Get in the way. We all live in the same house. And it doesn't matter whether we are black or white, Latino, Asian American, or Native American. It doesn't matter whether we are straight or gay. We are one people. We are one family. We all live in the same house. Be bold. Be courageous. Stand up. Speak up. Speak out. And find a way to create the beloved community the beloved world, a world of peace, a world that recognizes the dignity of all humankind. Never become bitter, never become hostile, never hate, live in peace. We are one, one people and one love. Thank you very much. Trees. Yes. Are, are we crying or what? Definitely moving and touching. And it is a call to action directly from the ancestors. They've left the, the blueprint on how to do it. You know, it's right there. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't that wasn't that so moving? And isn't mm -hmm. this so fitting for what it is we're talking about here? Definitely. Right. Definitely. Do you see why why I wanted to include that here? And mm -hmm. I was just so moved, so moved that by this whole thing who does he sound like martin luther yeah sounds in, it, exactly like martin luther king right and so i was grieving so much because i felt like who do we have now mm. that is talking like that there isn't anyone else that we have that is like that there isn't and so he's passed the baton and it is now up to us so that we can really fully step up and continue and carry on the legacy. We have to do it. We have to get in the way. We have to stand up for our values. We have to speak up. And that's mm -hmm. what we're doing. And that's why this couldn't have been a greater time to launch this movement. And that's why, you know, we're going to be having conversations about you know, racism, you know, what is the behavior? And that, we're gonna get into it here in just a minute, but we had to set the stage and use, you know, the 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 high form of what it is the vision is. Right. You know, what is the vision? And what is your vision with this, Latrice? My vision is to be able to have authentic conversations that can shine a light on the insidious nature of racism and what we can do to be anti-racist, to um, make sure that we are engaged in dialogue that is, has the ability to change hearts and minds and behaviors. Like there's a paradigm shift um, and we have the ability to create the reality that we wanna live in. And so it's having those conversations 
um, really being honest and, and uh, truthful about what we say and how we say it, uh, and also holding space for folks to receive it and be able to respond to calls of action to make the world a better place. So that to me is the vision. Yeah, that's, that's really beautiful. You know, I'm, I'm with you and that is building relationships. Mm -hmm. I'm with John Lewis in building the beloved community, right. having the space to really listen to people and to make amends, you know, mm -hmm. and talk about things uh, so that all, all, all people can be heard about how they feel about it, how they feel and, uh, you know, bring their, bring their um, heart into it, right? Having those conversations. So where do you right now today in your own life, like in your community, in your community, like work or where, mm -hmm. where do you see that, um, where do you see that the racism is exists and you know, where do you see it? Like, what do you say? Yeah. Um, in my experience, in my lived experience, it, it literally is everywhere from um, seeing it systemically play out to the way that we uh, are engaging with law enforcement to the laws that are written, um, how we are looking at professionalism and globalism and capitalism, all of those things are intertwined. So the justice system at work, in our homes, in our communities. And there's also, you know, in addition to thinking about being anti-racist, there's an anti-blackness that is also associated with that. And that's um, within the black community, but it's, it's widespread, it's everywhere. Uh, and so it really is about us wanting to all do our work um, and have those difficult conversations that will allow us to change laws, change hearts, change minds, change philosophies, change attitudes. But it, it's literally everywhere. It's everywhere and it's nuanced, right? So it's, it's a spectrum and, and varying degrees of how you experience it, but it's everywhere. Yeah, so where, where are you focusing your energy like, you know, how are you having those conversations mm -hmm. outside of this? You know, where where is it showing up? Where are you, uh, you know, showing up in it? Because, yeah, um, I would say that it informs who I am as a person. So it is on me in every space that I enter, um, in every conversation that I engage in, because I'm in this body and I have this phenotype and I'm proudly African-American, pan-African at that, right? So um, there are lots of spaces that it shows up. And because I have this body that I'm in, I'm a divine being in the form of a black woman, right? Uh, and I have black children. And so literally in every encounter, it's an opportunity. Um, if I have capacity to engage and discuss in it further, you know, taking care of mental health and um, self-care, but it, it really is everywhere. And especially in the climate of what's happening in our country right now, you know, um, there really aren't opportunities coming up where it's not open for discussion, right? Even waiting in line to go to the grocery store, simple things, everyday things um, because of what's happening, because everyone is really raw right now and folks are experiencing it. Some folks, it's a new revelation of what's actually happening in this country uh, and across the, the globe. And then for some people, black people and people of color, this is our reality, right? So it's an awakening for some, um, but it's just a confirmation of what we're already experiencing for others. And now we're collectively um, focusing energy on this. Yeah, yeah. Talking about it. Yeah, exactly. And that's, I think we need to, you know, we need to do that until, mm -hmm. until we don't need to talk about it. Exactly. We need to talk about it until, I mean, <laughs> talk you know, about it and talk about it and talk about it some more. Um, it really is engaging in those spaces, right? So if, if solving racism um, were solely up to the folks that are experiencing it firsthand, black folks and folks of color, it would already be resolved, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there's a brutality that exists from generation to generation to generation for as long as we've been in this country. And so really, um, it is about folks who want to be allies or want to be anti-racist, um, understanding that, that that commitment is lifelong. Um, it's not just reading a book and or listening to a podcast. It is, it is engaging in that conversation and eradicating racism where it exists, even in yourself and anti-blackness where it exists, even in yourself. So it really literally is everywhere. Yeah. yeah. 
And that's why it's so good that we're, we're talking about this openly and you're mm-hmm. going to, you're going to, uh, we're going to keep bringing this conversation to you to the public and we're asking you to engage with us i think this is a good time for me to uh invite you all for a call to action like basically when you see this podcast or see the youtube video please comment underneath what you got out of it and where you're working within your own community or within your own being uh what calls to action are you taking to you know heal the division heal the racism and you know where is it that you're um taking action on another way that you can support us you can support us by sharing this podcast and sharing this video out with people so that we can spread the message and that we can spread the news because like john lewis said we're not waiting we're Mm -hmm. getting in the way we're causing good trouble we're having the conversations we're being courageous and we're putting ourselves out there and we'd like for you uh, to support us in sharing that and, and being not passive, but being active and helping us get this message out there because we're just beginning. So this is just brand new. We don't have it all planned out, figured out. We're just organically coming in and going, okay, we're going to, we're going to do this. So we would love for you to join us and be engaged with us. Do you have anything to add to that Latrice? Yeah, I think the the moment and the time is now. Um, As I mentioned before, the ancestors have given us the blueprint. So every one of us comes from a collective of ancestors. And um, I think for a lot of people, uh, there are ancestors in our family lineage, right, Um, that have done all that they can to be able to eradicate racism or to speak out against it. Um, And so we're made of all of all of that. And so to really bring it forward. you know, the baton has been passed and now it's time for us to continue their good deeds and their works. Yeah. Um, did I say your last name? Goodlet? Did, is that right? It's love Goodlet. Yes. Okay. Because I thought, is it Godlet? Goodlet? I just wanted to make sure I had that right because I only know you as Latrice it's Love. Latrice Love. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. I got that right. Good. Um, so let's see what, let's find out a little bit more about you. So what is it? Who do you serve? And what do you do? Um, So I love to be of service for folks that are transforming their lives. And I get a real sense of um, beauty and love from being able to build community. So I have a social media marketing agency, the Real McCoy Social Media and Consulting, um, that in, interacts or inter, uh, engages rather with folks um, to be able to push forward the narrative of being authentic, um, to, of being inclusive. And um, that's one of the areas in which I operate in that space. The other thing is as being a singer and a musician, um, creating good works of music that allow people to tap into um, really the love that inner, inner, is interwoven and connects us all um, and giving, giving um, special space for speaking the truth about lived experiences, um, but really that we are all about love. Um, and so that the name Good Love uh, is, is one of the music groups that I perform under. And then in my nine to five job uh, with Seeds Conflict Resolution Center, uh, there I'm the community programs manager. And so it's about, for me, equity and access and making sure that um, folks have um, information on how to transform conflicts that they're experiencing interpersonally. So I'm doing a lot of good work, but those are the places where I'm of service. Um, and then also my most important job, aside from working on myself, is raising my two sons. Um, and hoping and knowing, right, that they'll go on to impact the world in positive ways, um, to be divine beings and people that are comfortable operating in their blackness uh, and comfortable um, speaking out and getting into good trouble, right, when, when needed, when necessary. Yeah, so I, I wish we would have had two pictures, one um, of each of your boys. So you have uh, Sankara, how old is he now? Sankara is 22 months. Uh, yeah, he's named after Thomas Sankara, who is a, a Pan-African revolutionary. And then my oldest, Jeremiah, just turned 11. 
Wow, 11. I remember him as Baby Cakes. Yes, Baby Cakes. Um, yeah, that's his nickname. That's his nickname. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how have you grown um, in your motherhood raising two Black sons? How, how, how have you personally grown mm -hmm. in, in our world, right? Yeah. Um, so, so when I found out that I was having a son when I was pregnant with Jeremiah, my ex-husband, and I, um, it was something that really shook me to the core. And I wasn't expecting that, right? So when we went in for the ultrasound and I found out it was a boy, I had this overwhelming sense of um, dread. Not that I didn't want a son, but just thinking about now I have to prepare him to be in a world where the world is unkind, where he could potentially lose his life, where he could potentially come across um, obstacles that won't allow him to be carefree and to be the person that he is uh, or should be divinely able to be. And so... When I got pregnant with my second child, uh, I waited to find out the gender until it got here <laughs> uh, because I didn't want to have to carry any more um, and focus energy in anywhere other than just having a healthy pregnancy and getting ready for how my heart would grow, right, in, in different ways. And so once Sankara was born, uh, and once I really sat with the magnitude of what it means to raise Black sons and understanding that the same fears the same um, love that I'm looking at my children with um, and the same sometimes uh, crippling weight of not being able to protect them, especially, you know, that they're phenotypically black, right? Um, and culturally black um, is not a new phenomena, right? So I can look back at how my ancestors handled that. Um, to be able to inform and give me strength to move forward. Um, but just to understand that I'm going to have to have difficult conversations with them, probably before I'm ready to. I have to tell them what life looks like for real in an age-appropriate way so that I can prepare them to withstand the weight of going out into an anti-Black world. And so those are the ways I think that motherhood has grown me as a person. It's, it's made my heart that much bigger but it's really made me step into a space um, where you have to just be fearless and courageous. And I'm finding out that I'm stronger than I thought I was, you know, that I'm a warrior raising warriors and that um, everything we do has to be for the betterment of our society, for our community, for our people, and really making sure that I'm operating in integrity and modeling that so that they will do the same. Yeah. And I think the reason too, it's beautiful how you shared that. I think that's also part of, you know, the work that you and I have done behind the scenes and then mm -hmm. also the work that you're doing on yourself continuously, because that's one of the things I respect about you so much because you're so in integrity, you, your, your heart general, uh, generously wants to really step into your full authority, into your full empowerment so that you can live in your true self in, in mm -hmm. your homecoming. And then you're, of course, going to, you know, give that out to your community, your sons and your family and, and everyone, because that truly is who you are, a beautiful, loving soul, a beautiful sister that is here doing such good works on the planet. And that's why I'm honored that we're doing this right now. Mm -hmm. And it's just how it organically is, is happening. And it's just wonderful to witness you in your courage, in your strength, and really, you know, stepping, stepping up into all the challenges, everything that you, even before you're ready to, right? Yeah. 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 So wonderful. Now, um, let's see, how much time do we have, Zach? How much time do we have left before we go into, because I want to, I want to focus on a couple things. Okay, we have about 20 minutes. Well, Latrice, I wanted to share with you an article that I had written of when I, when I was a racist. I, um, I, didn't, I didn't realize that at first, but after George Floyd, I had written an article about, you know, my, my whole uh, journey of coming to America when I was 13 years old and I, I grew up in an interracial household. Mm -hmm. And then I had, I had written this article. And then after that, this next article came out. And because we want to get to the root core also of what 
racism really is. So if we, you know, we, we want to get to the root core of what it is and Mm -hmm. where it begins, where it begins. Right. So I wanted to share this with you uh, today here on this show. And because I don't think that you, you have heard this. I, I don't, I don't think I've shared this with you. Have you heard me talk about this before? No. Yeah. Yeah. So here is, here is my article here. Uh, I used to be a racist. I know that sounds contradictory to my last article, the one where I told you about growing up during the 60s in an interracial household in Germany. It's not what you think. I was a racist against my own white race. My mother and my new stepfather, an African-American man, married when I was 13 and we moved to America. He was practically a saint. Goodness gracious, marrying a white woman with two teenage children and bringing them to this country. He was a chief master sergeant in the military, a Capricorn, and he usually did things by the book. I thought the name calling would end once we got over here to America, but little did I know that the hatred against black people was far worse here in the US than it was back in Germany. At age 17, I began dating. I fell in love with my very first boyfriend who happened to be a black man. We were deeply in love and enjoyed our relationship for 13 years and all the challenges that came with that. From 1978 to 2003, I walked intimately with my black families and my black lovers and many black friends that were so willing to take me in as one of their own. I was the minority. I have always felt such a deep soulful resonance with black people. After experiencing lots of name calling, people staring at us, I had to stay in the car when my partner was paying for a hotel room in Alabama in 1981. Mm -hmm. I felt like I myself was black and I wanted to be black because I felt more accepted in that community than I felt accepted by the white race. I felt so rebellious against the white people that I actually hated them because of their judgmental attitudes and because of their white privilege. Being different and having been discriminated against had followed me my whole life. So hatred began to arise in me, real hatred. I remember many times when someone in my African-American family was getting married and it was pointed out to me that I was the only white person in the church. Or when we'd go out to the clubs at night and I was invariably the only white person in there. It wasn't until late November of 2002 after moving to Washington State, I ended up moving to a town that had one black person living there. It was then that I found myself face to face with an inner demon and realized even I had become a racist. That was when it really hit home. It took a moment, but eventually I was willing to work on healing hatred against my own race. It was only when that finger was pointing back at me and when I saw that the healing I needed to do was to heal my own self-hatred that I was able to locate the root core of my hate. I was then free to feel love for all people because I started by first learning to love myself. This is why I know it can be done and why I have faith in all humanity. Over the course of the next six years, I had begun having withdrawals due to the fact that I was no longer able to be around black people. I would go to blockbuster stores and I would rent movies just to feel normalcy again and to fill my withdrawals with the laughter, with the soul, with the music, the creativity that I would find in watching those movies. The conversations that we need to have with black and brown people is to be willing to listen to their pain and their stories in a non-judgmental space until all the voices are heard. Because I'm a shaman, I understand how long things take to uncover, to dive deep, to unearth all the mud and transform it into forgiveness. And it may seem like when is all this going to be over and when can we get some peace? When all the crimes of our humanity against each other that have been held in compassion and love and understanding. 
when we can ask for forgiveness for any part that we played in keeping the separation going. And when we can say, thank you for forgiving me and I'm sorry for your pain and I love you. We are after all walking each other home. Wow, that is very powerful. Yeah. You know, that is, that is, uh, I think where it all begins. If each person can sit with really looking at that self investigation, Mm -hmm. where they feel, where they are with it. And, you know, no matter what race you are, no matter what, where you are, and really look at and see, is there judgment there? Do you Mm -hmm. have judgment against there? And then bring it back to yourself and yeah. really look at that. I, I think that if we, if we all did that, if we all did that and we were all accepting of one another because like John Lewis said, we are one family, mm-hmm. one race, that if we can do that and if we can bring the truth there, the love there, that is the place to begin but we have a lot of work to do. We yeah, have a lot of work to do. we do. Yeah, I would definitely say that there's work for everyone to do. Um, and, and definitely, you know, being understanding that it's one thing to think about anti-racism um, as an ally or as a white, self-identified white person, what can I do? Um, and then looking at the anti-blackness in, in the spaces that it presents itself and I think one of the things that comes up for me in particular uh, is to believe black folks, like we and folks of color, we shouldn't need to present a preponderance of evidence, empirical evidence, a treasure trove to say um, that this has been my lived experience and this is what's true for me. And I think um, that it really takes a a deep commitment um, and a growth mindset and the ability to know that you may get it wrong and that's okay and not to have an expectation um, that a person of color or a black person will walk you through their pain, um, but that it's okay to ask and to know that the person may say, you know, I don't really have capacity or no, and that be enough. And there not need to be an extra um, quantifier about that. You know, if folks have to deal with it, anti-racism and racist spaces as it comes up in everyday life and that commitment um, to constantly being aware of privilege, to constantly um, be using your privilege in a way that opens the door for access, for um, equity, and for fairness and justice for for everyone, right? So I think it it just takes um, a commitment of understanding that we're really all in this together. Yeah. Do you also feel like, like, you know, like, do you, do you feel like it would be helpful that if, like, for instance, let's just say you would be, or, you know, when we go to the next podcast, Jennifer, mm-hmm. anybody would just, you know, that um, was talking about how they feel when they get discriminated against. How do you feel like, you know, when, when it happens? And even today, do you feel like even people are looking at you like uh, not uncertain, like, you know, like this looking at you like with a left eye or whatever you know not not really like like even you know you know how it is when um when um when when there's a a loss in the family and I Mm -hmm. know that you know what that's like yeah and um how then some people don't even know how to say I'm sorry you Mm -hmm. know your loss right Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. even talk about it yeah And do you feel like that would be helpful? I think it's helpful. I think it's always helpful to shine a light on what someone's experience is um, so that you can empathize, so that you can be aware that it is happening. And then you can be looking inside your own relationships, inside your own interactions with folks to monitor that and to um, really understand that it's not necessarily about your intention, but your impact. And if a person is impacted by something that's been said or something that's been done, they get to define what that means and what that is, that experience is for them. Um, you know, there's a, there are plenty of books out there that, that people can go to that are written by Black people and people of color that are documenting their experience Um, documenting the historical things that have happened and the laws that exist. Uh, So, I mean, the information is definitely out there, but I do think hearing a narrative 
and the story from someone who's living it and experiencing it is powerful. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, um, like, you know, the, the practice of maybe you and I can uh, do a practice of where it could begin. Mm -hmm. If there's two people, you know, it doesn't really matter uh, whether, you know, black or brown or uh, and a white person but if they use the practice of a whole ponopono with the consciousness of coming together mm-hmm. to uh to say these these four things and would you would you like to um practice this with me for a moment yes okay so um it could look something like this that i would come to you and we would sit and i would say I'm sorry, I'm really sorry, Latrice, for all the suffering that you and your family and your ancestors and all the people in your community has had to, has had to deal with. I'm really, really sorry about that. Yeah. And I want to say, would you, would you please forgive me for my part in any, of, in any of way that I contributed on any level, on, in any space? Would you, would you forgive me for any place where I played a part in the separation or I didn't stand up and I didn't speak out or... Would you, would you be willing to forgive me for any part that I played in the suffering to keep it going? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I want to thank you. I want to thank you for, for loving me. I, I want to thank you for, for being who you are. I want to thank you for forgiving me. And I love you. I love you. I really love you. And I feel like if we did this, just this very simple process, it would be so helpful. Do you feel that it would be? I feel like it would be helpful, um, especially if you are dealing in this space where relationship already exists, right? And coming from a real, truthful, authentic place. Um, there are ways that it's racism is perpetuated. And so um, it is about accountability, responsibility, making amends. And now what do we do to move forward? You know, and I know you as a person, so I know the words are not, um, you know, in vain. They're not just spoken without some type of real action behind it. Right. Hence this show and all of the other ways that you show up. Um, And so, yeah, that's that's really important and powerful. Yeah, I, because I really feel like uh, that people, you know, just making amends, making amends, having the space that, you know, like no matter what the suffering is, that if, you know, for someone to be able to say, I'm sorry for the suffering, mm-hmm. and I'm sorry if I played any part in it, mm-hmm. would you forgive me for it? Would you forgive me for my unconsciousness? Mm-hmm. Would you forgive me for any place where I stayed silent and I watched it go on and I didn't speak up, whatever, you know, it's like that something as simple as that is is something that we can all do and it would really add value to our being humility in our humility and you know being um in our humanity Mm -hmm. you know it's it it would be it would be a beginning and it's doesn't it doesn't cost much it's heart opening it's humbling it's heart opening and it's a way that would bring us together rather than uh take us apart keep us apart, I should say. And that's part of, I think, this time, the order of the day is that how do we build the loving, the beloved community uh, in ways that we can have the conversations of what the Mm -hmm. pain was. And then, um, you know, do you have something else you want to add to that, Latrice? 
Um, I just wanted to share this quote uh, that I love by Bell Hooks, which is, beloved community is not formed by the eradication of differences, but by its affirmation, by each of us claiming the identities and cultural legacies that shape who we are and how we live in the world. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. So what do we want to leave the audience with today? We have just a couple minutes before this show is over, but mm -hmm. we're going to go straight into podcast number two. And um, what, do we, what do you want to leave the people with? You're going to come back. We have three minutes. Mm -hmm. You're going to come back next month and we're going to keep this, this movement going. And we're going to keep having the conversation and dive deeper into ways that we can support each other to build the beloved communities and to be anti-racist. What do you want to leave the audience with what calls to action? Uh, I definitely think that there is ample opportunity to support uh, with your consciousness, with your um, income, with your um, ability to make change. There are lots of opportunities for folks to engage in wanting to be a part of the paradigm shift that's happening. Um, and so uh, I would say, you know, support Black business. That's one great way to do that. And um, I would also um, say that you want to be intentional when you're dealing with folks and to be as authentic you can, uh, as you can about it being a learning situation. You know, you're going to get it wrong and that's okay. You make amends and move forward. But I think what I'm most curious to know uh, is what you would like folks to do at this time. How do you Aww. want folks to move forward from this? Yeah. This is beautiful. What I would like is I'd like for them to share this information that we shared with everyone. If you want to become a sponsor of the show, because this show costs money, we would love it if you would donate your, uh, your financial contributions and you could email me at radio at corneliastephanie.com and you know say I want to donate if it's a dollar if it's five dollars it's five thousand dollars if if you're a business and you want to have um you want to sponsor you want to sponsor us exclusively we would mention your name of course or anonymously but really uh just help us get this information out there and be active with us engage with us in the community on YouTube, share it with us, share with us, uh, you know, topics that you want to talk about, or what you're doing in your community, in order to uh, be an anti racist and really heal the division that has caused us so much suffering on this planet as a whole. That's really what it is that I'm I would like. Thank you for asking that Latrice. Sure. Yeah, it's been it's been wonderful, very moving, very moving. Uh, new beginnings for us all and mm -hmm. yeah definitely support the businesses to support women entrepreneurs yes. right because yes. yes. we're also moving into that equality we are it's about equity and a redistribution of wealth and opportunity and access um and i would say if folks are interested in learning more about what i'm doing or um to engage with me in consulting um that i have a facebook page real mccoy social media consulting, uh, you can find me there and um, book an appointment and I'm happy to help creative solutions to bring forth um, authenticity, inclus inclusivity and um, diversity. Wonderful. Thank you everybody for listening and tuning in for helping us spread the word. Thanks Latrice. Let's get in good trouble. Love you. Good trouble. Love you. Love you. Take care. <laughs>